Good morning. My name is John Snow, and I'll be your host for tomorrow, uh, this morning's webinar. This is a third in a series called Elevating Minds. Today, we have four guest speakers to provide information on a variety of topics. First, we'll hear from Natalie, aka Hotmail, Barbie Airy from Masonlift, who is the major account rep in British Columbia. Natalie will be speaking to us today on tips for buying a lift truck. Secondly, we'll hear from Amanda Colson. Amanda is the aftermarket sales manager for Central Division at Lifto, and Amanda will be sharing some information on the value of maintenance. Then Ryan Ratzlaff from Badger Lift in Wisconsin will be speaking to us on the total cost of ownership. And lastly, we'll hear from Jordan Brimley. Jordan is with Lift Training, and he will be sharing some information regarding in-house training and external training and also on pre-shift inspections. Okay, let's get started. Natalie, welcome. Thank you very much, John. I'm happy to, to be here this morning. Let's just start here. So, um, good morning. Yes, I am Natalie. It's early here on the West Coast, so thank you. If there's any West Coast people out there, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, you may have seen my YouTube video on how to buy a forklift, eight questions smart buyers ask. I have a YouTube channel called The Forklift Girl. So, uh, if you haven't, let's dive in uh, right away. So, a forklift is a really big investment. There's a lot of options and there's so many things to consider. So let's review all of the eight questions you should ask so that you don't have buyer's regret. So that you can buy with confidence. The first thing you should know is what are the specifications you require? Capacity. What is the maximum load weight that the forklift will be lifting and what are the, what are the load weight dimensions? Every forklift has a capacity that's based on a standard 24 inch pallet, 24 inch load center. If you have longer loads, this will affect the capacity of the forklift. Also, if the forklift has an attachment like a side shift or a clamp, this will derate the forklift's capacity. The next really important thing to know is what is the height required? What will it lift in inches? To this will determine the mass that's required on the forklift. There's different types of mass available depending on your requirements of max overall height and restrictions such as the ability to go into trailers or overhead door constraints. Number two, usage. How many hours will you use? Will they increase in the future? How many shifts do you run? These are all very important to determine the forklift that will best suit your application. Number three, fuel type. Electric versus propane. Let's talk about the pros and cons to both. The benefits of an IC truck are that it's a lower acquisition cost compared to an electric truck, and it's easy to change a propane tank. There's no time to wait for charging. Also, you get consistent power throughout the shift. The drawbacks to an IC truck is that it requires a lot more maintenance and the emissions are higher. With an electric truck, the benefits are lower cost of ownership, zero emissions, which means a cleaner work environment, and a longer life due to less moving components. The cons are higher initial investment and more time to charge the forklift. Charging options vary, and technology is very advanced these days to where you can plug in on brakes with an opportunity charging system or a fast charge system. Number four, tires. Cushion or pneumatic, which do you choose? Cushion tires are best when operating on smooth warehouse floors. Treta cushion tires are also available for wet conditions and non-marking tires are good for food processing applications. Pneumatic tires. 
There are two types of pneumatic tires, solid or air tires. Air tires are similar to the car tires, where solid pneumatics are good for yards like this, where it's possible to puncture a tire with screws or nails. Number five, attachments. Give your forklift superpowers. Here are the most common attachments used on forklifts. There's a single double pallet handler, which allows the forklift to handle two pallets at a time. There's a fork positioner, which has the ability to move the forks hydraulically in and out without the operator having to move from his seat, which is much safer. And then there's a bail clamp, which is used on loads without a pallet, such as this. The arms grab the object from the side, eliminating the need for the pallets to be picked up with forks. Then there's a special attachment like this, if you wanna give someone a big hug. New or used, what do you choose? A used unit is great if you use the forklift less than four hours a day on a single shift. A new unit would be better for multiple shift and higher application, higher hour application, a new offer also offers reliability and higher productivity with less downtime. Lowest cost of ownership versus lower price. Which do you choose? It may be tempting to purchase a lower cost forklift thinking it's a great deal. You may save money in the short term, but smart pot buyers choose lowest cost of ownership so what makes Toyota the lowest cost of ownership? There are many things that go into this, which include price, maintenance, safety, useful life of the forklift, fuel, performance, and productivity. And finally, number eight, support. This one's really important. Who's gonna be there for you when you need them? How fast can they get there to arrive to, to fix the forklift? How easy is it to get parts? Are there rentals available if necessary? These are all very important questions to ask to make sure that you get the support your business needs to run efficiently and keep your production high. Partner with a trusted dealer. Get the job done right the first time. So in summary, Toyota has been the number one selling forklift for 14 years in a row. They are ranked the highest in quality, reliability, safety, and the lowest cost of ownership. Like I always say, I'm not high maintenance, I'm high quality. Some things are just worth paying for. We look forward to working with you on your next, next purchase of a Toyota forklift. If you'd like to watch my video on how to buy a forklift, please subscribe to the Forklift Girl channel, where I provide weekly videos on how to help your business be more productive and efficient through the use of forklifts. Thank you very much. That was great, Natalie, thanks. Uh, it's definitely a lot of things to consider when buying a lift truck. Um, and I would say, please, uh, whenever possible, take advantage of our skilled sales staff who are more than happy to come and uh, help you make the right decision for your application. Um, I just want to point out that uh, there is an opportunity for people to ask questions and we're going to answer as many as we can at the end of this presentation. So please type in your questions and uh, we'll, we'll answer as many as we can. And next is uh, Amanda Colson. Amanda, welcome. Hi, thanks John. Okay guys, thanks for tuning in this morning. My name is Amanda Colson. I'm the aftermarket sales manager for Lifto Limited for the central division, which is Ontario. I'm going to talk to you this morning about maintenance. Maintenance is a pretty vast topic. Um, so I'm going to focus just on planned maintenance and why that is so crucial for your fleet. So in order to kick off, um, we're just going to start this morning with the definition of what are we talking about when we talk about planned maintenance. Um, so you might hear this referred to in the industry under a number of different names preventative maintenance, preventive maintenance, program maintenance, or plan maintenance. Pretty much the abbreviation is always going to be PM. 
And what it actually refers to is a scheduled maintenance, which is done at a regular interval. So I like to make the analogy with a car. So when you buy a car, um, basically you're gonna take it back to the dealership to get it serviced at a regular interval. That interval is normally gonna be based on kilometers. So for example, you drive it for 6,000 kilometers, you take it in for an oil change. The same is true with regards to your fault lift truck, um, only the interval is based on hours of utilization rather than kilometers that are driven. So same idea, regular maintenance at a scheduled interval. So why is this so important? Uh, why is it crucial for your fleet to undertake this, this planned maintenance on a regular basis? So the first, first uh, main area is the reduced downtime. So basically, if you are operating your forklift trucks in an environment, for example, manufacturing, if that forklift truck stops to operate, um, that can be at least inconvenient. At worst, it can shut down your entire production line. Um, if you're in distribution, for example, it can prevent you from meeting your uh, deadlines on customer deliveries. If your truck is down, a delivery comes in, you can't unpack it, et cetera. So everybody in the industry basically equates downtime with lack of productivity. Lack of productivity uh, costs us money, impacts negatively our bottom line. So we want to make sure that that downtime is reduced. So the more you maintenance the trucks on a regular basis, the more optimized you'll be able to uh, use those trucks, optimize the utilization. The uh, second point is extended fleet life. So simply put, if you maintain the asset on a regular basis, it will last longer. Um, or maybe you have a predetermined fleet life that you use for your assets. Maybe, for example, you depreciate over five years. Either way, you want to make sure that you can optimize uh, the utilization of that forklift, that it's running correctly uh, whilst you have it. The third is operator safety. So obviously you want your trucks to be safe for the operators to, to use. It's extremely important within any application. And there are specific safety features that are built into your forklift truck. The obvious one would be brakes, for example, um, or overhead guard, et cetera. You want those elements, the safety features on the truck to be checked on a regular basis. Make sure that your operators are safe. And the final one, Natalie referred to earlier, which is your total cost of operation. So when we refer to total cost of operation, we're talking about how much money you are spending in total to run that truck. And you can measure that over a date range, for example, three months, six months or a year. Um, so why is planned maintenance impactful on your total cost of operation? Well, if you think about it, if you incur an issue on your forklift truck and nobody looks at it, nobody realizes that there is an issue and you continue to use that truck at the end of the day down the road that repair will be more costly to fix so it can negatively impact your total cost of operation so i've got a little chart here this graph uh, that shows the maintenance curve typically on a forklift so you can see that years one and two are in the green there typically when you buy a new forklift um, you will have equipment warranty on it for the first two years that will cover a good part of your parts and service needs. Um, but looking at years three, four, five, you can see that the cost per hour of utilization does typically increase. When you reach 10,000 hours, that's really when you can expect your costs on your forklift to start to escalate. That's when those major repairs start to happen. Um, but if you have not been doing planned maintenance during the lifespan of the truck, you can expect that to start to happen a lot earlier than 10,000 hours. So what is covered at the time of a visit? What should you expect uh, when a technician shows up to do a plan maintenance? Um, so you can see here, we've got a checklist, which is the Lifto Toyota checklist. And this is for a plan A. On the left-hand side, you've got uh, the plan A for electric lift trucks. And on the right-hand side, you've got internal combustion lift trucks. And you can see this checklist is pretty similar. This is just a number of um, issues, topics, uh, features on the truck that the technician will check at the time of the plan maintenance. Um, at Toyota, we have two sets, two programs. We've got a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is your main maintenance. So some of those more thorough checks 
major uh, services are included in your plan A. For example, um, hydraulic oil flush, transmission oil flush, those will be done at the time of the plan A, not necessarily the plan A, the plan B. Um, so you can see that basically this checklist comprises of a combination of visual inspection, mechanical inspection, operational testing, and also those major service additional items for the plan A. If we take a look at plan B, this will happen in between the plan A's. And again, the checklist is shorter, but again, you're covering the visual inspection, the mechanical inspection and the operational testing. So typically when your technician shows up from any service provider, they should be able to provide you with a list of what they are going to look at, and that list should be comprehensive. Okay, let's talk about intervals, scheduling and completion. So how do we determine the interval at which the program maintenance is done? Well, this depends again on a number of criteria. Um, so the first one is the make, model and the age of the truck. Um, so typically what we do is we look at the recommendations in the manufacturer's service manual. So that goes back to the make of the truck. Also the age obviously can impact um, how often you want the maintenance to be done, older units require a bit more TLC usually. The second criteria is the annual usage. So again, if you're using that forklift a lot, so for example, you're using it in an application 2000 hours per year, you would expect your frequency of uh, maintenance to be higher or more frequent than if you're using it 1000 hours per year. So your annual utilization of that truck will have an impact on the criteria. And finally, the type of application or the operating environment in which you use that truck is also going to have an impact. So a clean, dry application will typically require fewer uh, scheduled maintenances than a dirty, wet, cold environment, for example, a freezer application or cold storage. So the harsher the application, uh, the more you would require maintenance on the truck. Okay, your PM schedule uh, should then be added to a scheduling system. So once your service provider has determined that interval, they usually will have an automated system into which they input that information. Uh, then they are automatically flagged when your scheduled uh, maintenance is due. What this means for you as a customer is you don't have to remember the next due date. They remember it for you, usually reach out to you and schedule for that technician to go in. This is especially important in Ontario for the annual lifting device inspection, which I will touch on in a couple of slides, which is mandatory by legislation in Ontario. So you don't want to forget that, right? So if it's in the schedule system at the dealership, they remind you, they will flag you that that is due and then it doesn't get missed. And timely completion. So once uh, we've got the interval, we've got the PM scheduled in the system, we want to make sure that the technician is actually going out to do those PMs in a timely manner when they are due. And Toyota has a benchmark. We strive for 90% PM completion rate per month. Obviously, some reschedule can be necessary based on your needs as a customer. For example, if it's inconvenient uh, to take a forklift off a production line at a specific time, you might say, oh, can you come back next week? In which case we would reschedule and push out the date to next week. Or maybe you've had that truck parked in a, car in a corner, you've not been using it, so you've not put sufficient hours on to warrant the next uh, maintenance to be done. So again, we can reschedule. But typically, the benchmark for Toyota is 90% PM completion rate per month on time. So some questions to ask your service provider. There are a lot of service providers out there, especially here in the GTA. Um, the market is quite concentrated. So you want to know, you want to have a good idea of some of the, the typical questions that you should ask as a consumer. The first one is really um, technician training. Okay, why is this important? So you want the guy that's coming out to service your trucks to be trained, to know what they're talking about, to know what they're doing, do it in a safe manner. If you go with a dealership that's affiliated with a manufacturer, typically they will have a very rigorous training program in place, not only before the technician goes out into the field, when they start with the company, they'll train them, but also annually there's a requirement of so many hours to be trained per tech, 
per year. Okay, so the reason that we do that is to keep the techs um, on top of the ever evolving technology in the industry forklifts. Uh, the technology is evolving very rapidly, the same as with cars. So the technicians constantly need to be trained, continuous improvement to make sure that they stay on top of those new technologies. So that's the question you would want to ask of your service provider. What kind of technician training do you put in place? That also impacts your cost because if the technician comes out and say he's doing a plan maintenance and finds a repair that needs to be done, if he's trained to do that repair, he can do it straight away, right? And he will usually, if he's with a manufacturer affiliated dealership, he will have the support of a technical support team back at the dealership, at the manufacturer, they'll have technical support that they can train and ask any questions and fix the truck right there and then, as opposed to, leaving your site which incurs the travel charge for you coming back later more downtime more travel cost etc parts warranty again the quality of the parts used at the time of your maintenance or at the time of your repairs is essential um all of the parts that are original equipment manufacturers so that are produced by the forklift manufacturers are designed as quality components they are engineered for durability to last for example toyota has a parts warranty of 4000 hours or 2 years so once that part is put onto your truck it is guaranteed to last for 2 years or 4000 hours that's actually an industry leading warranty but a lot of the larger manufacturers will apply that to the oe parts as opposed to what we call aftermarket parts, which you can also buy. Usually they're cheaper, but they don't come with the parts warranty um, or the parts warranty is significantly shorter. Also, for example, with the Lifto parts warranty, um, if the part does need to be replaced, Lifto or Toyota will cover the cost of the labor as well to replace that part, which is important. Van stock, so van stock refers to the parts that the technician carries around with them during the day in the van. This is important because that van stock should be tailored to that technician visiting your specific site. So when they come out, they should have all the parts ready to do the PM in the van, but also some frequently used parts, just in case, again, they detect a minor issue. Uh, whilst they're there, they can repair it right there and then on site. Additional charges. So you wanna look at your not only your agreement for plan maintenance with a service provider, you want to read that, but you also want to look at the invoicing once they start to come in, because there are charges that can be applied. Um, some of them are completely valid, like typically you will see a service van charge, a travel charge, um, environmental charges if they have to dispose of fluids, sundries. Uh, but then you might see some other miscellaneous charges creeping in there, for example, information technology charge, things like that that you might want to question. So always look at the uh, the line items that, that show on your invoice. There should be no hidden costs, basically. And finally, um, data reporting. So Natalie referred to total cost of operation. I referred to it earlier in my slides. It is important that you know how much that forklift is costing you over the course of time. So you need the data to be able to look at that and a good dealership affiliated with a manufacturer will be able to provide you with that data as opposed to an independent or jobber that don't necessarily have the same data reporting capabilities. So let's move on quickly, industry guidelines and legislation. So there's a main paper um, that regulates the guidelines within the industry for forklifts. It is the CSA B335-15 lift truck standard. Okay, and that was developed by the Canadian Standards Association, which is basically a group of industry professionals and safety experts. And then that paper is approved then by Standards Council of Canada. Um, so it really sets the industry guidelines and safety standards for lift trucks and it covers topics such as the requirements for facility design, your racking, etc., uh, pre-operation inspections, going through that checklist before you start the shift, load handling, operator safety, training, battery storage and charging and I believe Jordan will expand on this in his training section a little bit but I would recommend that you purchase that paper if you want to truly inform yourself about the safety guidelines and the operating guidelines for forklifts within the industry in Canada 
um, any industry. So you can buy that at store.csa um, and it costs you approximately 120 Canadian dollars to download it or you can go in and you can just view it for free. So I want to highlight a couple of areas that are crucial within that document, within that CSA document that refers specifically to plan maintenance. Okay, the first one is that 8.1.1. So this clause has been provided to assist lift truck users and trained operators in maintaining their lift trucks. 8.1.2, in all cases, plan maintenance and inspections shall be conducted in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. These specifications can typically be found in the owner's manual. If you've lost your owner's manual, you can call up the parts department at any dealership and order one. It will cost you some money to buy one, but they are available normally through the parts department. So the key is that they, they are asking you to follow the manufacturer's guidelines and recommendations. And then I'll refer you to 8.1.4. In the absence of the manufacturer's manual, expert advice shall be obtained. This information in this clause can serve as a general guide to ensure that the most common critical components are properly inspected and maintained. Going back to that plan A, plan B, you want to make sure that checklist is in place and everything is getting checked correctly. And finally, um, we talked about the annual lifting device inspection. Okay, so um, again, this is from the CSA guidelines. So if you look at point B, an annual planned maintenance inspection, which is carried out by a trained, qualified maintenance technician, is required, basically. And this is law within Ontario. The other provinces may differ a little bit, but in Ontario, this inspection should occur approximately every 2,000 hours or annually, whichever comes first. This is crucial when our technician comes in and does this service, this annual lifting device inspection, they will stick um, a decal on the mast with the date of inspection. The Ministry of Labour will come around and blitz certain industries. They will come into your facility and they will be looking for that sticker on that mast and the paperwork that shows that you did that annual lifting device inspection. If you don't do it, you can be subject to fines, etc., through the Ministry of Labour. So it is crucial that you get that done. And our programme maintenance schedule system can help you to not forget that. So just a recap of the key takeaways, why is planned maintenance crucial for your fleet? Reduce downtime, extended fleet life, operator safety, impact on the total cost of operation and adhering to local legislation. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, our website is lifto.com. You can contact us through there or just call into any local branch and we'll be happy to help you. Thanks. Amanda, that was great, thank you. Um, if I could just add, if anyone is looking at um, keeping their truck uh, from the beginning right to uh, cradle to grave, um, we've seen trucks that have been 25, 30,000 hours, and that's because they've maintained them right from the beginning. But if you're also looking at uh, upgrading your truck at any point in time, um, you're gonna have a significantly uh, uh, better trade-in value on a truck that's been maintained versus one that's been neglected. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, next, Ryan's going to be speaking to us about uh, total cost of ownership. So Ryan, welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks again for uh, being part of uh, this webinar series that we've done. Um, you know, we talked a lot earlier in Natalie's presentation and most recently Amanda's in terms of total, co total cost of operation and ownership. Um, very, very critical things. Um, and Natalie had a great slide there. Uh, it represented an iceberg and what's below that waterline. Um, there's a lot uh, to it. And I think that when we're acquiring uh, pieces of material handling equipment, there are things that we just don't seem to think about in certain situations. So I'd like to dive into that a little bit more with you today. Um, so here is a, a spreadsheet uh, that we've we've put together, and I think it's a very good representation of an entire purchase of a lift truck. So in this case, we're going to start from right to left on your screen. Um, we talk about dis disposition. What happens to the truck afterwards? Is there damage? Is there trade-in? Um, in this particular scenario, uh, we figured about $3,000. 
Um, we then also look at fuel and insurance, which is something that is definitely below that water line in the iceberg or on the iceberg in the water. So um, in this particular case, uh, we're using an LP truck. Uh, we figured a cost of $12 to fill that tank, um, $60 weekly for that fuel. Annually, it's about a $3,000 expense. So lifetime total on that truck is about $15,000 for fuel. Um, also the insurance uh, throughout the lifespan is about $6,000. So we look at about $21,000 in fuel and insurance, which makes up about 7% of, of that truck's cost over its lifespan. The next, as we move to the left here, is, is maintenance. And uh, it's actually uh, pretty interesting here. Now we've gone with a full maintenance scenario. So um, we haven't really talked a whole lot about full maintenance, but um, full maintenance is uh, something where we can provide you that service um, for the entire lifespan of the truck. So um, in this particular scenario, we're looking at about 2000 hours per year. Um, we can maintain that truck throughout its entire life cycle at $1.50 an hour. Um, so about $250 a month. And uh, the total maintenance cost then for that life cycle of five years is $15,000 on that particular piece of equipment. And then, of course, there's always going to be abuse or damage. Um, I, I don't think we've ever seen uh, in any of our customers where we've had a little bit of that, maybe a, you know, a seat wears out or uh, tires, that type of thing. So we looked at about uh, $1,500 on that. And generally speaking, we'd like to see maintenance or damage or abuse um, at or below 10%. But as you can see here um, in, this, in this slide, it's about $16,500 of its total cost, uh, which represents about 6% of, of the actual cost of ownership. We then look at purchase cost. Um, so the actual acquisition of that truck. Now, in this case, we ran a lease. Um, we looked at a 5,000 pound cushion tire forklift LP fueled. Um, we figured a lease payment of about $315 a month for 60 months. So your total spend then would be about $19,000, which is again, 6% of the total cost of ownership. Now to the big one, operator cost, labor. We have to consider that we have to have an operator utilizing that truck. So here's just a, an example here um, of a single shift operation. So we have a, uh, an employee or, or operator that's making $20 an hour. Um, benefits, we figure in an additional $325 an hour. So an all-in burden rate of $23.25. At eight hours a day, that's $186 daily, five days a week. Um, basically, this represents about $46,500 total annually. Now, if that operator, that's their key role is just to be on that truck, that's a total um, labor cost of $232,000, which represents 80% of that truck's total cost throughout its life cycle. So something, very, very key here to think about. This data can start before you even purchase a lift truck. These are things that we can look at with you and help you determine the right piece of equipment for the application before we have, as Natalie mentioned, that buyer's remorse. So let's just take a look here at some of these factors that we have to consider when purchasing a, a, a forklift or a piece of material handling equipment for that matter. What will this forklift be doing? Really, what's its end game? I asked that question because, you know, are we using it as a lift table? Is it going to serve other um, areas of the operation? Um, and again, will this forklift require a full-time operator? Is this something that, um, is, is the unit gonna be sitting around a lot? Um, you know, are we gonna have multiple people? Are there gonna be multiple shifts? Um, the other question you have to ask yourself is, will you be hiring an operator? Are you gonna to have to fill that seat on the truck? Um, another good one is let's talk to accounting. Let's figure out whether we're gonna be leasing or a cash purchase. Again, this is all of that data that we can start with right from the gate, get go, and actually input into that spreadsheet to help you understand that total cost um, for that term. Um, are you considering the right type of equipment? 
more often than not, we just um, kind of get tunnel vision some, sometimes, and we select the wrong piece of equipment that might have a higher acquisition cost or might strictly be held captive um, to that area where we may want to utilize it in other places. Um, to my next point, will you use this equipment in other areas of your operation? Um, and then the other question you want to ask yourselves, if, if you have multiple units in your fleet, what does the use, utilization look like on, on them? Is it possible that you could take a forklift and, and move it over to this other area where you're considering adding a piece of equipment? Natalie touched on as well, LP or electric powered unit. Um, you know, is, is that dictated by safety? Um, is that dictated by your insurance company that you have to have electric powered units versus LP? Those are all things we need to take into consideration. Um, also, are there safety concerns? Um, are we working a, around a lot of pedestrians? Um, are we in a very tight, narrow application where we could probably have a, um, an operator injured? So that's something very, very important to, to consider. And then also, can you predict the utilization on that unit um, that you're considering purchasing? And it's very hard to look into a crystal ball and say, this is what we're, what, how often we're gonna use it, but it's, it's definitely something to consider. So, so with all that, um, again, many factors, and there's a lot out there to choose from, from reach trucks to simple walk behind pallet jacks to um, uh, load stabilizing platforms, sit down trucks, up to 80,000 pound lift trucks. Which unit is the right one for you? So I would strongly encourage you um, when you're when you're looking at a piece of equipment and understanding this process is really give us a call. Let's talk about it. Why don't we come in, take a look at the application, and we can kind of develop this plan together. The other thing is we talked a lot about labor. I mean, as, as you know, in the previous slides, it actually made up 80% of the overall cost of operation of a lift truck. So what are some of the things we can do? Well, I'm sure you've all heard automation, automation, automation. We see a lot of conveyor beds and things like that, but forklifts are being automated now too. So could automation um, work for you? Um, so really when we look at uh, automated forklifts, one of the things that we want to think about is eliminating that labor in that particular situation. Automation is not really designed to eliminate employees, but yet it's rather there to help repurpose them, um, put them in value added um, positions within your company. So really, you know, with, with AGVs, um, as you can see here, we can move product, non-value add moves, um, vertical runs, lifting, putting things away, stuff that just takes a whole lot of time, long runs, this can be a very valuable uh, solution for your company. And uh, I, I think it's definitely worth talking about. Uh, ROIs can be very, very quick on things like this because of that 80% cost of labor to the entire package. So why don't we just go ahead and wrap this up here. So our key takeaways labor. It's really expensive. I think the data really proves that. Um, and there's no smoke and mirrors with that. Um, please call us. Um, we can run through this type of scenario with you as well to show you that in, in your particular um, uh, application. Also, give us a call. Consult your lift tow, your badger, your mason lift sales rep for qualifications for your specific needs. Very, very important to do that. Um, and really, Make sure you're selecting that right piece of equipment for the application. Back to Natalie's point, the buyer's remorse, that's always very difficult to buy a $30,000, $40,000 asset and not use it to its uh, full capabilities. Also, it's very, very important to understand true utilization, how often that truck is going to be working. That affects so many things to Amanda's point of total uh, operation, maintenance, um, if we have a truck that uh, is very, very seldomly used, but you know there's damage on it, or um, you know we have to come in and, and do quarterly inspections, that raises that um, 
cost per hour considerably. So we want to make sure that we're getting the most out of that particular piece of equipment. And then lastly, leasing with full maintenance. What a benefit. Um, full maintenance can really just level the playing field for you. Um, consider if we've got a lease payment of $300 for 60 months, and we know that our maintenance for that truck is going to be $250, and you know damage might be uh, 10% of, of that, think about how we can budget. We can budget, we can be a level playing field all the way across the board. So it's a really fantastic um, opportunity for you. So. Um, if you have any questions, I please, I urge you to give us a call, um, discuss with us uh, what we can do for you. And um, again, I appreciate you being with us today. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. Ryan, that was great. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're seeing more and more automation applications out in the market. Uh, in the various uh, regions that we cover as the Toyota dealer. Uh, there's some really cool products that uh, Toyota has developed and that we are starting to uh, introduce. So again, take advantage of our, uh, our sales staff. They're uh, uh, very, um, uh, they're all very strong and factory trained and, and are here and ready to help you. So um, next, uh, Jordan Brimley. Jordan, take it away. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so in the, the last webinar, I spoke about the benefits of uh, e-learning training. Uh, this episode, I, I wanted to get, kind of get in the difference between in-house training versus external training and really what's best for your company. Um, we get asked this question a lot, um, asking about the in-house model or that train the trainer model. And uh, although it's very popular and highly requested, um, there's a lot of uh, sometimes confusion or uh, some, some companies really don't know what goes into it. So I'm gonna get into a bit of that. Also, uh, I will be speaking a little bit on pre-shift inspections and uh, not only the importance of doing them, but uh, the method that most companies use. So really, uh, which one's best for you? So we have the in-house train the trainer model, um, which, you know, for for best use of an in-house train the trainer program, we're really looking at maybe these four bullet points that I'll get into more. And that's a large number of employees, uh, high volume of turnover, remote locations, and uh, maybe if you had a unique business. Um, for external training, uh, we have you know it's it's really best for most companies. It's it's cost savings a lot of the times. Uh, you also get that full support from us or that training provider. The paperwork and uh, certificates are always documented properly, stored properly, and then courses are instructed professionally. So uh, let's first talk about the in-house Train the Trainer program. So really, what is the Train the Trainer program? So for those who don't know, a Train the Trainer program is a course that'll give your company's trainer or an assigned person in your organization the knowledge, uh, training, and experience to be an effective in-house trainer. So in layman's terms, we teach your trainer how to train your employees properly. Um, we give your company all the tools, resources, the information so that they can certify their staff and really to make sure that they're competent operators. I would probably say about 20% of the companies that inquire on the Train the Trainer program really don't have an idea what it is in all honesty. I, I think they know the basis, but they've just been told by someone, hey, this is a good course, uh, I'm inquiring about this. But it really takes a professional to to really figure out is this correct for your company so candidates for for this course must be competent and certified on all types of equipment that you have in your facility so it's not just one or two um a new trainer would have to go through a three-day train the trainer program where an experienced person would go through two um previously we used to do a one-day train the trainer course for experienced operators as a refresher course but we recently have changed this to a two-day program. Um, there's a few reasons for that, and I'll, and I'll get into it next. But no matter if you're new or experienced, you must take this two-day course. And as I mentioned, the recertification for the train the trainer used to be a one-day. Um, and this is really to ensure that your trainer will learn and understand all the content, um, or at least revisit all the content if they came back for um, their recertification. And as you can see, there, there's quite a bit of information here. And each section, we, we dive into um, very significantly. So day one, we have our agenda that we go over, the operator theory quiz, 
introduction in law, capacity, stability, pre-shift inspections, pedestrian awareness, safe operations, fuel sources, and dock safety. So this is basically taking a forklift operator kind of regular course, but expanding it and diving into each individual topic so they can understand that and, and really uh, grasp that to answer questions. Day two is more about how to become the best trainer. And that's the adult learning principles we go over, qualities and duties of a trainer, setting up your training space. Uh, we go through training exercises, like how to conduct a practical evaluation, uh, if you have new operator training, narrow aisle drills, things like that. And then explaining the trainer kit, so our evaluation forms, our PowerPoints, uh, anything that they need that, that we would give them on that uh, USB or online. And then we actually would do the evaluations for the instructors, make sure that uh, you know at that time, we're at least getting them to be recertified for three years if they're operating these lift trucks. And then finally, the train the trainer exam, um, which is a pretty lengthy exam, a lot of writing with it, but it has to show that um, they understand this information. Uh, at the end of day two, we also try to get them to prepare for day three if they're attending. And day three is a teach back day, which really means our instructor takes a seat as if they are a student and grades or evaluates your in-house trainer on the content that they learned over those past two days. So a lot of times we get them to recite uh, two modules, which is stability and capacity. And these are really due to being the hardest to remember and teach. And that's because of the uh, amount of content that's in there, the math that's in there. And if they can teach us correctly and answer um, questions from our instructor, they really set out um, for the other modules and, and it should be fine. So at that point, even though it's not a requirement for an experienced trainer to take the teach back, this is why I would highly recommend that every experienced operator go through this extra day. This might be the only time that we've seen this person in the last three years, and we maybe won't see them again for another three years. So this is the time to take that extra day. It's 100% worth it. Um, we can, again, sit down. Our instructor takes that seat and really reviews what they're saying because there could be things that are being said incorrectly that you might be relaying to your own employees. So, again, al although our Train the Trainer program could be um, a great program for your organization, there's a ton of information that that person needs to know. And uh, it's an overload of information. So really the downside of doing a train the trainer is one, the, the amount of responsibility you kind of take on inside your organization. And your, your instructor only has two or three days to really learn this. So as a new instructor, you have at best 24 hours of training from one of our instructors. And unlike with us, we don't get to choose the right person for your company. So you might be assigning this person. Assigning the person is crucial. Um, not anyone can just be an instructor. Just because someone maybe is your best operator inside the organization doesn't mean that they necessarily should be a trainer. So finding a great instructor is very, very difficult. First, you need someone who operates the equipment, all of it in your facility. You need to take that operator and make sure they're comfortable standing in front of the class. Then you need to ensure that person's not too aggressive, uh, not too passive, but someone who can really um, be that involved and like a great manager. And then they also need to be organized and great at paperwork and other admin duties that they need to you know, be, be good at. So in a nutshell, you're looking for an operator, manager combo, who is also a sales rep along with an admin person. And they need to learn all of this information in 24 hours. Um, it's, it's a pretty hard thing to do. And to give you a comparison, our instructors are handpicked through a very in-depth hiring process. They also get anywhere between 500 to 700 hours of training, not 24. Um, and then they also get shadowing and everything before they teach a class. So they also have full sales support, admin support, um, systems, processes to get the job done properly. So you can see how, um, although you know we would love to be able to keep your employee to go through this process, I don't think uh, many companies would like if I had their employee for 500, 700 hours. So this is something that we have to work with in this three-day uh, term here. Um, so what does the standard say about the, the train the trainer? So as Amanda mentioned, um, you know, CSA standards, it's it's a something that I would recommend everybody buy. Um, this is something that would go through so many sections of 
uh, operating lift trucks, maintenance, safety, everything with it. And section seven of it actually covers the qualifications of a lift truck trainer. Now, I'm not going to read this word for word, but basically there's two pages in the standard that speak on the train the trainer program. Um, one will talk about minimum qualifications. And as you can see, trainers will also need things like WIMIS and possibly transportation and dangerous goods and fall protection if necessary. Uh, those courses are available online. They're the easiest to do online. And it's something that uh, they're able to take at their own pace uh, with those that three days, because we need all that three days to talk about lift trucks. We keep it to that. Uh, and then we would look at WIMIS, uh, TDG, and fall protection later on. And then keep in mind, again, there's no separate standard for this. It is just this section seven. So as you can see, the possible downside, it's again, the amount of information that they have to learn, um, that they have to have, and the fact that they might maybe, again, be the best in your company to do the train the trainer, they have to also meet a lot of these requirements. Um, this is something that if you go through, I mean, it's not just the knowledge, but the operating skills, the instructional instructional skills and abilities. So they need all this in there. And, you know, when you call us to figure out, is this right for your organization? Because we get a lot of inquiries on this, we want to kind of go through, and this is a quick little a checklist for you. So one, um, if you have a large number of employees, so if you have like 50 plus employees, um, this is something that we would look at saying, yes, I, we believe that you should probably consider train the trainer. Um, but we want to make sure that over those 50 people that you're doing and hiring a little bit more than those 50 people, um, that you might have 50, 50 employees or 50 operators, but you will realistically have turnover. And this would make sense for someone to do train the trainer. Um, we want to keep this information fresh in the trainer's mind. So this is why in order to qu kind of qualify this, you need to be doing this a lot. You can't be doing it once uh, once a year or, or twice a year. Um, the other thing is high volume of turnover. So a steady amount of new employees every year. So maybe you have less than 50, but you have a lot of uh, temporary staff, maybe a seasonal business. Um, and sometimes the nature of their business, we see higher volumes and turnover. So today people leave jobs for you know 25 cents, especially ones with those lower pay grades. So um, that could create a high volume of turnover and increased training. Um, the next is remote locations. So, you know, northern areas, um, maybe away from other training providers, although we're across Canada, we don't have facilities in every single city or state. So um, this might incur travel costs and things like that. So remote locations, this is where maybe you're below that 50, maybe you don't have a high volume of turnover, but it may make sense to your company as a cost factor. And then unique businesses and unique businesses, some, something like freezer environments, maybe cross docking facilities, um, attachments, although uh, our instructors can go in and uh, you know teach that very well. Um, sometimes if you have a unique business or, or a unique situation, it's it would be nice to kind of go in and get a course that's right for you and build it almost for you. So that's something you can chat about with our uh, account managers. And um, the other the other thing I don't have on this list, but I, I wanted to say one where you you wouldn't necessarily qualify or we wouldn't want to kind of go down the road of train the trainer is when you're completing multiple train the trainer courses. So I had one client that inquired for his one trainer to complete forklift, aerial platform, and skid steer. And um, you know this would be something like a nine day class basically, and this would be an impossible learning task in that amount of time um, you know you got three different legislations it's a ton of information it's not something that we would realistically um, uh, you know recommend that you end up doing so you know external training provider um, we have again uh, branches all across Canada um, instructors all across Canada and in the United States and it is really the best training method for the majority of companies. And that's because I would say the majority of companies do fall under the, that 50 operators part, but it's also, um, you know, it's a lot easier for most companies and it's the easiest way because they don't have to manage the upkeep or worry about the internal training program. Um, per person cost savings, I think 95% of our training actually happens at the client site. Group rates are available. 
Um, your employees don't necessarily have to have that again on their shoulders. Um, and you know, if it consists up to four hours every three years, it's really not a, a lot of time that we're taking away for your employees. Um, you also get full support from Lyft training. So while we're at your facility, you have to think that we also have a second set of eyes to spot maybe a potential hazard or something that we should address that could otherwise be overlooked inside your facility from your staff. Um, all operators are evaluated by our staff and any questions can be addressed by our professional instructors rather than searching for the answers internally. I will say either way that we go, um, you know, we have either course, but when you're really looking at external training, it's it's a lot less stressful. It's a lot less on the manager. It's a lot less on the trainer. And you can be assured that uh, all that is being supported from us. Uh, paperwork and certificates are stored and completed properly. So storing paperwork ensures that obviously the course was done correctly. The necessary paperwork is there. Um, and, and that's something that in the event that anyone asked, a governing body, et cetera, uh, we store them forever, even though they're valid for three years, we have them uh, on a, a online portal and a client portal that, that you'd have access to. And then uh, biggest thing, I think the courses are instructed professionally for training the trainer programs, um, you know, for any trainer that is listening out there, you know, stick to the plan. Um, you know, our program is designed for you to teach it that way. Um, don't go off the yellow brick road here. Um, what we have in our system is the best way. Um, what we don't like to see and the reason why we like that teach back on day three is we don't want them going off on a different direction. We don't need to hear about your dog or camping trip. Uh, trust me, I've heard instructors say this. So we, we really want them to be doing this. And that's the importance of really that teach back on that day three. So you can be confident that our trainers um, that are, you know, coming in and doing this properly and this can also get your staff to hear it from a professional which can obviously reduce accidents and even increase productivity by them doing things more efficiently and correctly um, the cons for external training are simply the topics we covered where the kind of trainer trainer program shines um, things like you know cost and um, the amount of training that you're doing so there's really no right or wrong answer here. Both programs have their place. Uh, there's not one, si one size fits all. And um, it, it, you know, something with compliance training, it's it's always different. It's dif different for each situation. So this is why um, you need to speak with a professional and not a fly-by-night training organization. You know, there's hundreds out there, but we're, we're the largest training provider in North America. We help you through the right process. Our account managers are professionals to work with your team, figure out what's the best for your company. And they end up saving you a lot of money and time by just choosing that right path with it. So before you have your uh, mind set on something, chat with somebody about it, figure out what the right path to go and uh, our team can get you there. I'll quickly uh, touch on pre-operational inspections. Um, this is basically what every operator should do prior to their shift. And uh, you know it's mandatory in many parts of Canada, the United States. So there are two parts to every pre-operational inspection. Uh, the first is a visual, and the second is the operational. So a list of items that every operator must go through. Visual are things like you know checking the mass, the tires, lift chains, hoses, etc. Um, operational are things like the actual uh, things that move, basically controls, the lift, lower side shift. You got your horns, your lights, alarms your forward switch, your backward switch. So really making sure that uh, it can it can operate properly. Um, operators, uh, when we teach them inside this, uh, actually any forklift program, we teach them you know the right way to do pre-operational inspections. Uh, we teach them that operators must note minor issues and lock out and tag out the lift truck if there was a major issue. This is where the supervisor can then step in and then assure them that the equipment is offline until the issues are fixed. The easiest way by far is to um, grab one of these inspector checklist booklets. And um, not only is it cost effective, but it's easy for management. Uh, we see some company use, a lot of companies use a single piece of paper um, and unfortunately, this piece of paper can get damaged or lost, um, and, and you really can't verify if they've done it, if they didn't hand it in, obviously. So we like to always set up systems, and we always like to have that insurance side of things. As a reminder, if there was an accident, 
the governing body um, in your area will ask realistically for three things in most areas in North America. And that's one, the annual inspections or the maintenance of the lift truck. We got the pre-operational inspection and then the operator's proof of training. Um, notice I, I said that uh, the operator's proof of training is last and, and that's actually the truth. Um, this is something that they want to make sure that everything was you know, proper on the lift truck first. The operator's proof of training, yes, they, they can try to deem it as operator error, but I'm, you know, if that lift truck had any severe accident on this, they were gonna want to see this and make sure that the lift truck was safe. So it's not only important to stay compliant, but even those areas or provinces, uh, maybe states that don't have this requirement, it's designed to keep everyone safe. The last thing you want is someone to lift a, a load in the air and that load falls because the hydraulics failed. Um, just because it's not the law doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. So always be above the minimum standard to keep your employees safe. These booklets, uh, you can get a booklet well with the caddy for $29.95. Um, one booklet's only $11.48. You can purchase them in a pack of four. And um, it, it just makes it so much easier to set a system. It's a carbon copy. You could rip off the top page, stick it in the manager's office. The supervisor now can look over it and kind of be on top of anything, whether it was a light, whether it was a horn, anything like that. They can start, um, you know, start ordering those parts and calling the, the provider for that. So it creates a, a system that obviously if piece of paper can't, um, one copy stays with the truck, one copy goes to the designated area, and supervisors must verify uh, the inspections and address any issues. At least they know what's done at this point. If the manager's office is not close, you can put it in a little bin in the area. Uh, some of our clients have little drop boxes around if there's different charging stations and things like that. Um, and, and again, you're not gonna be able to get surprised and uh, be stuck with any issues here. Um, so as always, um, you know, for more information on anything I covered today, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or visit lifttraining.com. Thank you very much. Jordan, thanks very much. Uh, okay, so uh, just to wrap up, we've got a few questions. So if I could welcome all of our uh, panelists back. Um, and just so you know, for those of you who haven't, um, if this is the first uh, webinar that you've attended, we will be sending out a link in the next 24 hours to all of you uh, to view the previous webinars and or if you want to share that with another colleague, you can. Okay, uh, so we've got a few questions before we finish. Uh, Amanda, there's a question for you and uh, the question is, uh, uh, I can get a PM service for less from an independent. Why would I pay more? Okay, that's a good question. Um, okay, so let's just do some quick math. Um, an independent might charge you $80 per hour. Uh, a dealership might charge you $100 per hour. But if the independent is taking three hours to do the job, you're paying $240 versus a dealership that's taking two hours to do the job, you're paying $200. This is why it's important not to focus on the cost per hour, but to look at the total cost of ownership. Also, what are you getting within that $100? You're getting all that support that I mentioned earlier. You're getting the parts warranties, you're getting the technical support, the trained technicians, um, and really at the end of the day, the accountability to a manufacturer like that independent um, is accountable to whom? Pretty much to themselves. Uh, whereas a dealership is accountable also back to the manufacturer and the manufacturer's pretty rigid uh, specifications that they have to follow. That's great. That's great. Um, I think it's a great point about the warranty that you mentioned too uh, through Toyota. Um, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. So uh, it's a great mm -hmm. point. Uh, Natalie, there's a question for you. Um, how do I know when's the right time to replace a lift truck? That's a really good question as well. Um, I would say a really good indication would be, I mean, when the forklift definitely starts to get older, um, maybe after five years and you're starting to see more breakdowns on the machine. Um, and certainly if you're tracking your cost per hour, like we've all been kind of talking about today, um, once that exceeds about $4, which is an industry standard, you should start to look at replacing the forklift. Um, the second thing is, you know, if your business changes, if you expand, if um, 
you're starting to bring in new products and the forklifts that you currently have are not efficient to move those products, you should look at maybe getting another piece of equipment and getting rid of the old equipment so that you can be more efficient in your business. Good, thank you. Uh, Jordan, um, if a trainer leaves our company, do we need to complete a uh, new train the trainer? Yeah, um, they would, uh, you know, you would have to get uh, a new train the trainer program. Obviously, we'd have to go through those uh, three days with that person. Um, we a lot of times recommend if someone's doing a train the trainer that they have um, at least two people doing it. And that is for the event that uh, somebody left. Um, but yes, they would, they would have to go through it again. And, and that's, um, maybe another kind of downside with train the trainer. However, if you have at least two people, then, uh, we, we could cover you a little bit easier that way. Good. Okay. And Ryan, there's a question for you. Uh, you mentioned full maintenance. Uh, what is the benefit of full maintenance? Um, really full maintenance, uh, it, in my opinion, it's, it's not only an insurance policy in that I don't have to worry about if if I were a business owner, I don't have to worry about any major repairs or expenses. Everything's covered under that full maintenance plan. And it also um, gives me the ability to really budget um, my maintenance spend. I always know what it's going to be every month. There's no hidden surprises or ebbs and flows uh, within that. So, um, you know, if you really want to stick to a budget and, and run a nice level uh, line, full maintenance is definitely the way to go. Excellent. Good. Um, okay, so this concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for joining and providing some information. Um, and on behalf of Lifto's group of companies, uh, we'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us today and wish you and your families all the best. Um, stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.